Cleveland was a city that once reigned over the Midwest during the peak of the Industrial Revolution until the 1960s as a major shipping port for steel and oil. But as the industry slowed, so did the economy. Cleveland quickly lost its source of livelihood it once had and fell into a cycle of poverty, racial segregation, and urban blight with a lack of economic activity and white middle class interest. In this documentary, however, I look at the Flats Forward project completed in recent years, which is an excellent representation of Cleveland's growing economic urban renewal. Through successful implementation strategies, funding strategies, and persistence, the Wollstone Group and Fairmount Properties were able to bring new light and promise to the Cleveland waterfront area. But in order to understand this, we need to know a little about the history of the city itself. The Flats, a historic area of Cleveland situated along the intersection of the Cuyahoga River and Lake Erie, was a first settlement in Cleveland, named for its elevation and situation in the Cuyahoga after its discovery by politician and surveyor Moses Cleveland in the summer of 1796. Due to its central location, both within Cleveland as well as the Midwest as a whole, the Flats quickly became a prime target for early settlement and trade. This prime location only brought more economic activity to Cleveland, with new innovations in transportation in the form of steamboats and freights, as well as faster production and manufacturing of goods as a result of the Industrial Revolution during the late 1800s to early 1900s. It was so successful, in fact, that the flats became the home of John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil Company, the single largest oil refinery of its time in the late 1800s. The success was carried out for decades, all the way through the 1960s, when the industry finally started to die down. If the slowly dying industry wasn't enough, the famous fire of 1969 was the icing on the cake in Cleveland's national perception as a degraded city. The issue of oil spillage into the Cuyahoga, blamed on the Standard Oil Company, had been ongoing for the past few decades with conditions worsening in the 50s and 60s with an influx of oil demand for cars, but wasn't tended to until June of 1969 when a fire provoked by an oil spill caused, quote, about $100,000 worth of damages to two railroad bridges, end quote. At the same time, though, Cleveland was framed and received the negative perception as the mistake in the lake that has become the popular belief until more recent years. When you combine this with the undesirable Flats warehouses, it was pretty clear why the Flats became wi widely ignored and avoided by the general public for years to come. However, with the increasing regulations on pollution and emphasized cleanup effort, the redevelopment plans and ideas began to emerge as early as the following year. In 1970, a group of University of Rhode Island community planning graduate students produced the first complete redevelopment plan for the flats, entitled, A Proposal to Stimulate Reuse of the Flats on the Site Where Cleveland Began. According to the plan itself, the need for a redevelopment plan stems from the fact that, quote, the area is generally dilapidated as evidenced by unused railroad tracks, debris, partially used buildings, and general lack of new structures, end quote. They focus on connecting the racially segregated east and west sides of Cleveland through increased modes of pedestrian transportation routes and an overall complete land use change from mixed manufacturing to five distinct areas of interest. Housing, goods, distribu goods distribution centers, vocational technical centers, entertainment, and recreation centers in order to spur economic activity and bring people back into the flats. While plans were circulating, the now-renowned real estate developer Scott Wolstein, who would later bring his dreams for real estate development in the flats to reality, bought a substantial amount of land parcels to build, build into apartment housing complexes, taking advantage of the cheap onslaught after land. His plans ended up falling through with the fluctuating economy and lack of redevelopment occurring until the 1980s and 1990s. While it seems insignificant at the time, Mr. Wilson's determination and foresight of the Flats area was ultimately comm commended upon in its later success. Due to its waterfront location, entertainment seemed the most viable option for renewal of economic activity within the Flats. While approved in the early 80s, the Flats Oxbow Urban Design Guideline, released by the Cleveland City Planning Commission in 1985, noted empty sites, the need for a changing zoning proposition, and increased public use along the Cuyahoga River in the form of trails, parks, and walkways, which would serve as a future point of emphasis in the next phase of renewal. Additionally, it proposed new street layouts to increase traffic flow and solve circulation issues in the now thriving flats, composed of dozens of restaurants, nightclubs, and bars, making Cleveland the number one destination for nightlife in the Midwest in the late 80s and 90s. The story comes to an end, however. 
And although the nightlife flourished, the lax liquor licensing and underage drinking presence came back to the Flats bars in full force in 2000, with three reported drowning deaths associated with drinking occurring in one month alone. The area quickly lost business as the mayor took action, cracking down on businesses that violated code violations, and people began to view the area as unsafe. As fast as it was built, the established bars and restaurants of the Riverside Flats were condemned, one by one, boarded up, and once again, the area became undesirable. This was the first true evidence of urban blight in the flats, as the millions of dollars put into the project resul resulted in a mass failure and hope was inevitably lost. It wasn't long after the condemnation of the Flats District that New Hope was seen yet again in the Flats due to the massive opportunity that the area provided. The true urban renewal of the Flats, which included the East Bank, the Historic Warehouse District, Ohio City, and the Gateway District, started funding in the early 2000s in the form of both public and private funding by organizations such as the Cleveland International Fund, the Wolstein Group, headed by Scott Wolstein, Fremont Properties, GPD Group, and the Flats Oxbow Association who facilitated the majority of demolition and raising of buildings in Flats East Bank as a part of the Flats East Bank Community Development Plan approved by the Cleveland City Council in 2005. The Wolstein Group and Fairmount Properties were accredited to the actual design and majority funding of the Flats East Bank development, a $750 million project featuring, quote, an upscale residential building, office tower, hotel, and many restaurants and entertainment venues, creating an urban riverfront community with unique character, end quote. First signs of raising of buildings and construction for the urban renewal project began with the approval of the Flats East Bank Community Development Plan by the Cleveland City Council under the Flats Oxbow Association. This approval was strictly for the Flats East Bank, titled Flats East Bank Project Demolition, which details included demolishing eight buildings along Old River Road, the undisputed center of the Flats, raising the buildings for reconstruction. In the following years, these buildings will be reconstructed into primarily restaurants, cafes, and a few bars to start to bring back the appeal the area once had. Along with this, Scott Wolstein, the man who had previously invested in lost money in Flats real estate, saw a new hope in the Flats and funded his own redevelopment project around the same time as the Flats Oxbow Association, proposing to complete this project in 2009. His project included, quote, 331 housing units and five- and six-story brick buildings. 255,000 square feet of retail and entertainment, 1,733 parking spaces, and a 455,000 square foot office building." End quote. Despite approved building, the real established report to revitalize the Flats was released in 2011, with the Flats Ford nonprofit organization interested in, quote, enhancing the quality of life and economic well-being of all Flats stakeholders, end quote. The Flats Forward project really started to gain momentum when they partnered with the Civic Commons, a civic engagement and community-led organization that brought the project to the community to hear what they desired in reconstructing the Flats area. The Civic Commons went to both the streets of Cleveland, along with social media, to hear the community's voice and give a name to it. The Civic Commons asked everyday citizens simple questions like, what do you want to see in the Flats, and what is your biggest hope for the Flats in the next three to five years? This served as a framework for the project and ultimately shaped the focus of redevelopment within the Flats Forward urban renewal of the Flats. After forming the Civic Commons guidelines and criteria, the Flats Forward project, like many of the projects before it, sought to create a holistic renewal process consisting of renewed public spaces, commercial businesses, housing, and office spaces. The plan also noted previous residential and commercial structures, especially those creating economic activity, and based future projects off of their success. Some of the other projects within the Flats Ford Redevelopment Project included residential developments in the historic warehouse in Ohio City districts, housing about 3,000 and 27,000 residents collectively. In addition, there is a proposed towpath trail linking the Flats area of Scranton to Cleveland, Akron, and beyond, including a large riverfront park area known as Canal Basin Park, as well as the Foundry, a $9 million boathouse project. Finally, Rivergate Park, a recreational kayaking, rowing, and bicycling area on the edge of the Cuyahoga, and the Cleveland Foundation Centennial Trail, which link the Ohio and Erie Canal towpath along abandoned railroad tracks through 1.5 miles of the west bank of the flats. On top of all this, the plan included reconfigured roadways to facilitate bike traffic, as well as allow more efficient traffic flows and parking in the flats area as a whole. The largest project included within the Flats Forge project was Flats East Bank, a mixed-use building that included residential buildings and a hotel, commercial businesses including over a dozen bars and restaurants, 
a fitness center, office tower, and even an extensive riverfront boardwalk, funded majority by the Wolstein Group and Fairmount Properties. The project was divided into three phases, and construction and expansion is still going on today, with four new restaurants and bars currently in development. The first phase of the project opened in May 2013, including Wolstein's 18-story, 500,000-square-foot UI office tower, along with the Aloft Hotel and a few restaurants. The second phase of the project included the majority of the project, costing $133 million, building a 241-unit residential building called Flats, Flats at East Bank Apartments, a 1,200-foot riverfront boardwalk around the complex, and over seven restaurants and bars finished in the fall of 2015. In terms of the future of the project, things are looking bright for Flats East Bank, with numerous restaurants and bars currently under construction and plans for Phase 3 to include a potential movie theater in the works, as well as street-level retail and 100 additional residences. Looking towards the future of the project, Scott Wolstein remarked, quote, This isn't just another entertainment district, it's a catalytic neighborhood that's going to place the city on the map as an urban waterfront destination, end quote. The question remains, why did the project do so well? The answer is a combination of things. First, there has been a nationwide trend towards an increasing interest in downtown real estate, and in Cleveland, and the now clean waterfront paired with easy access makes the flats prime real estate for both residential and commercial success. In addition, the project was able to succeed due to the diversification of funding from both private and public sources that allowed costs to be offset to multiple parties rather than a select few. Finally, I believe the implementation of the project itself, as a project des designed towards the interest of the people, allowed for the embracement of the project as a whole. To end, I'd like to emphasize the fact that poverty, poor sanitation, and degraded city landscapes are not static. With the right implementation strategies, funding, and determination, areas like the Flats nationwide can break free from doubt and prejudice towards a new economic rebirth.